I went to too many games at the end of June, and last week I made a video talking about a lot of the games I got from vendors all over uh, too many games, from independent publishers to random vendors, and got a lot of cool stuff. Got a lot of weird Switch games, uh, some 3DS games that needed to be in the collection, all the way down to a Super Nintendo game that I've been looking for for a long time. However, I mentioned at, in that video that uh, we, we were going to do a second episode because I bought uh, too many games and didn't want to try and fit it all into one video that would probably have been over an hour long. So uh, what I also mentioned is that a lot of those games came from a s separate vendor, one single vendor. So I bought 55 games over the course of all of Too Many Games, and 32 of them came from one specific vendor. So that vendor is Chris from Rewind Arcade, who goes to a lot of conventions, also sells on eBay. So if you have the opportunity to uh, support him in one way or another, please do so. Go check out his videos uh, when his eBay is uh, back up and stocked. Go check him out there as well. And uh, yeah, Chris is a really, really great guy. Uh, besides the fact that he worked out a deal with me for so many games, uh, we met last year at Too Many Games, and I kept going back to his booth. I kept finding things I wanted. Then I saw him in another marketplace uh, at some point in July, and uh, we exchanged numbers and have been talking since, and he's a, he's a really good dude. So, uh, Chris, thank you so much for working out a deal with me for uh, all these games, but also uh, it's, it's been a pleasure getting to know you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at more cons, uh, and hopefully sooner than that. So, we're going to go through all the games I got just from Rewind Arcade's booth. Uh, like I said, it's a lot of them. It's entirely Japanese stuff, so uh, forgive some of my pronunciations, but uh, we're, we're going to get through all of it. So, we're going to talk about uh, two Nintendo handhelds, we're going to talk about some Sony systems, and we'll cap it off with a game that is from neither Nintendo nor Sony, uh, but we'll start with the 3DS. So the first one is Dragon Quest VII, Ida no Senshitashi, Senshitashi uh, which is also just known as Dragon Quest VII, Fragments of the Forgotten Past. This game was originally released in Japan on the PS1 in 2000, and it came to North America with a different title in 2001 as Dragon Warrior VII. So you play as the protagonist, traveling back in time to restore continents uh, for the present day by defeating the Demon Lord, and you have to do that twice. That's an oversimplification, but Dragon Quest is one of the most famous, probably the most famous JRPG franchise of all time, so uh, these games don't really need much of an introduction. Uh, this game, or the, the original PS1 game, was ported to the 3DS in Japan in 2013, but it didn't get uh, a, a translation into English until 2016. So it took uh, almost 15, 16 years for North America to get a Dragon Quest VII officially. Uh, at least in a nice remastered version. So it's pretty cool. Uh, when I got home, I realized I had, uh, this is now my second copy of this game, which was by accident, but you know, these things happen. <laughs> Moving backwards, uh, we're gonna talk about the DS next. And uh, yeah, some, some really interesting ones here, some familiar ones. So the first one is Brave Story, Boku no Kyoko to Negai, or just better known as Brave Story New Traveler, which is a 2006 RPG based on the manga, which is titled you guessed it, Brave Story, and you play as Tatsuya in a different realm as you collect stones to restore a sword so that you can go back to your realm to restore your best friend's health. Yeah, that's that's about as far as I got. I saw this green guy in the front, and I'm like, what the heck is that thing? Had to get it. And uh, yeah, protagonist is wearing a sweatshirt, so that's pretty cool. Kind of, kind of an interesting one. Next one is a familiar game, came out here in North America, uh, Donkey Kong Jungle Climber, or known here in North America as just simply DK Jungle Climber, is a 2007 platformer sequel to DK King of Swing on the GBA, uh, but it, you, you help Donkey Kong retrieve the crystal bananas uh, to return them to uh, Zananabab, Z Z Zananabab, uh, Zananab, yeah, X A N. A-N-A-B, or uh, if that didn't make it clear enough, it's Banana X spelled backwards. So uh, bananas are funny. We love Donkey Kong. We, we love monkeys in general. So, uh, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense that it's in the collection. But it, the, the gameplay itself kind of looks a lot like Donkey Kong Country. Uh, you trick via platforming like you do in regular Donkey Kong Country games, but you also cross these like peg-based platforms, which I know is like, it's a platformer that makes sense. But uh, it's, it's kind of like a unique method of travel that is like not super common. So requires a little bit of skill to get that down. 
But uh, yeah, it's Donkey Kong. You can't go wrong with Donkey Kong. We love Donkey Kong on Maximum Collecting. Next one is Gintama DS. Yorozuya, Yorozuya <laughs> Daisoto, uh, which is a 2006 adventure question mark game with the goal of paying off debt via jobs and missions. So uh, I say question mark because there's not a lot of information about the game itself. However, uh, Gintama is a franchise that was based on a 2003 manga, and it's about a freelance samurai named Gintoki uh, in a world inhabited by aliens that invaded. I can't tell you anything else about the game, but at least I could tell you something about the manga <laughs> and the franchise. So kind of cool. He, I mean, he looks pretty cool. Look at his hair. He looks, he looks super awesome. Next is another uh, familiar series to some. This is Leighton Kyoju uh, Tofushigi uh, Namashi, or better known as Professor Leighton in the Curious Village here in North America. So this is a 2007 puzzle adventure that's the first in the Professor Leighton series, and you play as Professor Herschel uh, Leighton as he investigates a mysterious golden apple through brain teasers from the townspeople. So that's kind of the entire series of Professor Leighton games, these like puzzling type of adventure games. Uh, there were two more on DS, and I think I have those two, actually. I probably talked about them at some point in the past. Uh, so it's a pretty it's a pretty niche series, not, not the most common to a lot of people. However, uh, it's getting its time because in 2025, there is going to be a new Professor Layton game. Uh, I think it was Professor Layton in the World of Steam, if I remember correctly, and it'll be coming to Switch. Or in 2025, it might even be the Switch's successor. So that's pretty cool. Popular game to get. And uh, yeah, I think I have now... The whole trilogy of Layton games on DS, unless I'm missing one. Next up is a game that requires absolutely no uh, introduction, but it is Mario Party DS. So this one is the 2007 party game that was the last one developed uh, by the original Mario Party team in Hudson Soft, and the only one released on DS. And that's actually kind of unique, one, because it's the only one on the DS, whereas a lot of systems get multiple right? Uh, Mario Party 1 through 3 was on N64. Mario Party 4 through 7 was on GameCube. We had two of them. Uh, sorry, the Wii had, had Mario Party 8 and 9, and Switch has now 3 with the new one that's coming out soon. So it's unique because of that, but also uh, there's the DS that has the microphone, so that's a big deal. Uh, it's got two touch screens uh, and has download play, so download play was super popular for the DS back then. You could have one card and one game cartridge, and everybody would be able to play. So that's pretty cool. Obviously, the 3DS games, I think there's three Mario Parties on 3DSs, but for the time when this was released, it was the only one that was capable of doing some of those things. So that's pretty cool. Followed Mario Party 8, and then was eventually succeeded by Mario Party 9, so it uh, split in half the Wii's Mario Party library, uh, and it introduced five boards and 73 mini games. So uh, if you wanted a way to play Mario Party on the go, you could this way. Uh, kind of reminds me of Mario Party on the Game Boy Advance, uh, but I, I, I couldn't tell you much about that one. It's been a long time since I played Mario Party on the GBA. Next one, very, very obscure one. Uh, this is Signal, which is a 2009 Otomi game that extends from a DS game called Backlash, but I could not find anything about a DS game called Backlash, because if you try Googling DS Backlash, you find controversy <laughs> instead. Uh, but Otome games in general... If you're not familiar, our story, uh, romance-centric games uh, for girls specifically. So uh, that, that's that's who it's for. Uh, you play as Miku as she interviews a racing team for her new magazine guest writer position, and your goal is to romance the members of the team. Kind of weird, but very popular type of game in, uh, in Japan. So cool to get an obscure one like this. Next up, uh, only two more DS titles until we move on, but the next one is Tamagotchi no Puchi Puchi Omosechi uh, Mina Sankyu, or better known as Tamagotchi Connection Corner Shop 3. Uh, it's kind of interesting on Game Facts. Uh, they don't have the three listed in the title. However, there's a three right there, or there's no three in the Japanese title, so that's a little strange. But yeah, it's a Tamagotchi game. So this one specifically is a 2007 shop simulator where you choose a Tamagotchi and, you're, and you run a shop in a simulation and uh it's sim based it's mini game based uh and your goal is to improve multiple stores so not just one type of store you can own multiple run multiple stores and your goal is to get the attentions of the princess and the mayor so uh this is a rare occurrence where we get all the games of a tamagotchi series so tamagotchi 
way more popular in Japan. Uh, obviously had its time a little bit here in North America with the dedicated handheld uh, systems. But uh, there's three Tamagotchi connection corner shops, and we happen to get all three, which is super rare. For example, there's, I think, four Tamagotchis on the original Game Boy, uh, but we only got one here in North America. So pretty cool that we were able to get all three uh, corner shops instead of just one, which probably would have been pretty common. So Tamagotchi, I remember from my childhood, didn't have one, but uh, it, it's still stuck in my head. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Next one is a, is a great game to cap off with for, for DS until we get into a whole slew of Sony games. And this is Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Spirit Summoner. Uh, if you've seen the channel before, you know I love my Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, but Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, I was already starting to fall out of Yu-Gi-Oh! by then. That was when I started changing my uh, gaming habits to more like sports games. Uh, not, not mature games necessarily, but I was kind of just getting out of Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, but still, this one, 2006 Yu-Gi-Oh! game loosely based on the GX anime arc, which I didn't watch. I, I'm kind of familiar with. I kind of remember it, but not, not super much. Uh, this game, so this game was released in November of 2006, but it contains cards all the way up to a series, I'm sorry, a set of Yu-Gi-Oh cards that was released only in August of 2006. So only three months in between uh, set release and game release. Obviously, the games were being programmed before that, but it is still pretty cool of how up-to-date it was at the time. You could play as Jaden, so you could play Jaden, Cyrus, Chaz, Zane, Aster, and Dr. Crowler. If you've seen the GX arc, you know who those people are. So uh, famous enough names that I remember them, but you could play them in this game. So that's pretty cool. We then move on to another handheld, uh, the most recent Sony system that appears in this video, the PSP. So I don't have a PSP. I've never had a PSP. I had one friend growing up that had a PSP, uh, but still some, some PSP games in Japan are, are a little out there. So the first one is Gungnir Maso no Gunshin to Ayo Senso, <laughs> or just better known here in North America as Gungnir. <laughs> so this is a 2011 tactical RPG where you're basically in a war between the rich and poor, and right before you're about to die, you get a demonic weapon that rocks the entire story, which is a pretty cool plot twist, if I must say. So it's kind of interesting that this game is considered episode 9 of the Department Heaven series, which is just a big overarching series, including multiple games that don't necessarily seem to have a connection to each other, but this is episode 9, uh, but there's only four games in the in the whole series, and this happens to be the last one. So there was an episode 1, 2, 3, all with different titles, all seemingly different, uh, you know, no, no connection between them, and this one was 4. I'm sorry, it was 1, 2, yeah, 1, 2, 4, and 9. So I don't know what happened in the middle, uh, I, I didn't take the time to look at what happened in the middle, but kind of interesting that they uh, numbered these in such a way. So, Gungnir. Next up is Ken Tomaho uh, Togakuen Mano 2, or better known as Class of Heroes 2. So, Class of Heroes 1 was released in 2008. It's a turn-based dungeon-crawling RPG with uh, 10 races of characters like humans, elves, dwarves, drakes, and celestians who have different effects against other classes, which is pretty neat. But then this sequel was released in 2009, only a year later, with more classes, more functionality. So it's it's more, it's, it seems like more just an update to the gameplay with a slightly different story than anything. Uh, but then there's also a class of heroes 2G, which adds even more classes, more weapons, more dungeons, and all that. So uh, the class of heroes formula, apparently very, very popular. Uh, so popular, in fact, that somebody on Wikipedia says that this game, this game, is getting a remaster. I don't know, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> Next up is Monster Hunter Portable, or better known as Monster Hunter Freedom here in the US. This is a 2005 hack and slash RPG that centers around building and improving your gear to progress and beat monsters and bosses instead of just brute forcing it, uh, you know, trying to beat it as quickly as possible. You actually have to take the time to improve your stuff. Uh, it's a port of Monster Hunter G, uh, with better with a better solo campaign, better balancing, um, so it's a little easier to get through the game. But it's also the first handheld game in the series, which is pretty cool in and of itself. Uh, I have a few Monster Hunter games. I've never played a Monster Hunter game in my life, uh, but it is cool to to see them and see some of the progressions within them. So, Monster Hunter. 
Next up is another RPG. There's there's going to be a lot of RPGs in this video. You, you get get ready for it. Uh, this one is Nayuta uh, no Kiseki, or The Legend of Nayuta Boundless Trails, which is a 2012 action RPG, part of the Trails and Overarching Legend of Heroes uh, series, where you play as Nayuta Herschel, who, while traveling home, ends up in the Lost Heaven, uh, lost, lost Heaven with his friend from the help of a fairy. And your goal is to save the Lost Heaven and, consequently, your own world from a, quote, madman. That's all I got. Uh, but it was brought to modern systems in 2021 and Switch in 2022, so there is a modern way of playing it. Uh, I can't say I ever saw uh, Legends games prior to, like, collecting for Switch. I don't know if I, I don't think I have any on Switch, but, like, I never knew they existed until I, like, started researching games and finally found uh, Trails and Legend of Heroes. So, cool to get a game in the series, even if I know nothing about it. <laughs> Next up is an interesting one. Uh, this is Shining Arc, which is another RPG, uh, released in 2013, but by Sega, where you play as a boy named Freed who discovers a one-winged girl who can sing to animals. There you go. It has a battle system where you move multiple characters around a battlefield, and you can also gather materials in gardening and hunting monsters. Or, sorry, you can gather materials via... Uh, gardening and hunting monsters uh but perhaps it's not quite a farm sim but it kind of i don't know for some reason it harvestella sticks out to me where harvestella is like a farm sim but you battle a demon in there i think that's kind of what i'm like picking up here uh the, the description for the game is very uh very calm right just you find a girl who can sing to animals but then all of a sudden in the gameplay it's like you can hunt monsters so i don't know what really what to expect from this game but shining arc pretty cool one that was not released in North America. Some of these, in one way or another, was were released in North America, but not Shining Ark. <laughs> Next up is Summon Night 5. This is a 2013 tactical RPG, but also a visual novel. that takes place in a universe parallel to and later than uh, previous Summon Night games at the time. So uh, different character selections lead to different things being available as the game progresses. And uh, that was about as far as I could get without getting really, really deep into the Summon Knight rabbit hole. So uh, this game might appear again in the near future, or another Summon Knight game might appear in the near future in one way or another. But uh, Summon Knight 5, not very common here, but very popular in Japan. And only one more game on uh, the PSP. And this is uh, this is definitely an interesting one. Uh, Super Rampa 2 Sayonara Zetsubo Gakuen, or known here in North America as Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair. So, uh, this is a 2012 <laughs> visual novel that is way too much to explain, but very basically, uh, the premise to each game in the Danganronpa series is that there's this evil bear who forces students to kill each other in a school. A killing game. Uh, yeah. Uh, Scott the Waz did a reaction to uh, the Switch port so uh, Danganronpa Decadence which was in my first Nintendo Direct ever uh, but Danganronpa Decadence has the first three Danganronpa games plus a new one in a collection and when Scott the Waz uh, was talking about all the Switch games released in, in that year he took like a 30 45 second pause just staring at the camera just being like what the heck and uh, yeah he, these games are twisted in one way or another and uh Everything that you would expect about them is, is pretty accurate, but go check out Danganronpa if, if a killing game seems of any interest to you. <laughs> so that's the end of the PSP. Let me move to another system I'm very fond of, or not, not another system I'm very fond of, a system I'm very fond of, and that would be the PlayStation 2. So some very interesting ones here. First one is uh, Beck the Game. So it's a 2005 adventure game based on Beck, which is a manga that began in 1999 about a group of teens who start a rock band, one of whom saves a dog and meets a guitar prodigy in the, uh, in the process. That's kind of how it starts. And then it's just kind of the ups and downs of, you know, making a band together. And uh, when I was sharing pictures of the games I got to, to friends, somebody was like, wow, Beck had a game. And my response was, you know what Beck is. <laughs> so uh, you, you probably can tell from a lot of the games I got in a, uh, in this group 
They're just things I thought looked cool. So, yeah, I didn't know what Beck was, didn't know it was an anime, but I thought it looked cool, so I got it. <laughs> Next up is Bokeno Beat, Darkness Century. Uh, it's a 2005 action RPG developed by Shade and published by Bandai. And that was all I got about the game. I asked Chris, I was like, do you know, do you know anything about this game? Like, this was the least I could find about any game at all. And he just said that one thing you could say is that Shade is an offshoot of Quintet. Uh, and Quintet is the developer for Act Razor 1 and 2 on Super Nintendo and Shenmue on Dreamcast. That's about as far as I can get talking about Shade and by consequence, this game. But it's an RPG. And he's wearing an orange vest. There you go. Next up is a game uh, fairly popular here in North America, a game that is uh, way more common here than I think in Japan. Crash Bandicoot 4 Sakuretsu Majin Power or Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex. So it's a 2001 platformer and the fourth, believe it or not, uh, four, the fourth main entry in the Crash series, but it was the first to be released on any non-Sony consoles. So I think the first three were all on PS1 and strictly on PS1 until they were eventually ported onto modern systems. Uh, the Crash Insane Trilogy. And in this game, you play as Crash and his sister as they take down Crunch Bandicoot, Dr. Cortex, and Mask Spirits. So I've never played a Crash game. They are very charming, though. They're very silly looking. And uh, yeah, it's the first game on PS2, first game to be released outside of Sony systems. So... It's a good little history behind it, but uh, Wrath of Cortex, Crash Bandicoot. Next one, very, very weird one uh, in terms of release history because we did not get it here in North America, but the uh, series is very, very uh, familiar to a lot of people. This is Gran Turismo 4 Prologue. So uh, normal Gran Turismo 4 was released in late 2004, but Gran Turismo 4 Prologue released a full year earlier in Japan and in Europe, uh, but not in America, like I mentioned. Uh, so it's a sneak preview. It says in this tiny little blurb down here that it's a sneak preview or a demo uh, with only like 50 of the 500 cars that were eventually in Gran Turismo 4. But here's here's where it gets weird. So there's multiple other demo versions of Gran Turismo 4 Prologue. Um, so for for one, like the most the, the most weird example is that there's a version of Gran Turismo 4 Prologue that was bundled with Toyota Prius purchases in 2004, both in, Jama both in Japan and here in North America uh, separately. So we, in North America, they didn't call it Prologue. It was just like a demo disc of Gran Turismo 4, but it was still basically the same thing. This was just like a commercial version of the demo uh, released a year early. So very weird release history for a kind of a non-assuming franchise but there's like multiple cases of their like weird demos um i think if you look at like the gran turismo wiki page there's like five or six different versions of demos of gran turismo 4 prologue or i'm sorry of gran turismo 4 that are like gran turismo 4 prologue so very weird history behind this game uh for just being a demo and having multiple versions of basically the same demo <laughs> with some added changes like i think like the toyota prius purchase release thing like you got a special Toyota Prius in that one very strange but very funny and very interesting uh for the purpose of this so next one is is another I keep saying they're interesting ones but like it's very cool to go and like learn about some of these games after uh you, you buy them which don't recommend that you should research games before you buy them but this is Kamai Tachi uh no Yoro 2 and it's on the walkthrough on Game Facts. It's uh, its title is Night of the Sickle Weasel Two, Prison Island Nursery Rhyme. I don't know how official that is, but that that's a heck of a title. So this game is a 2002 horror visual novel sequel to a Super Famicom game, uh, where you play as a blue silhouette, which is what you see here, uh, who is brought to a deserted island by the real life creator of the first game. So we're we're kind of breaking the fourth wall here. Um, and when you were brought to this island by the real-life creator to the Super Nintendo game, or Super Famicom game, I should say, um, the Super Nintendo game also exists. So this very weird interconnectedness of, like, fourth wall breaking without, like, actually addressing the player. Uh, kind of weird, but, like, these blue sprites are completely, fully 3D modeled. Like, 
even up to their hair, you, you are literally just a blue 3D sprite, which is really, really cool in terms of animation. Um, but apparently, this series is a really, really big deal, and this game specifically had a TV drama made about it, and a third game that concludes the storyline. So there's one on the Super Famicom, this one on PS2, and I'm drawing a blank as to where that third game came from, but very, very interesting for a horror game. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't realize that's what it was, but now that I see there are, like, no eyes in the blue sprites, now it's kind of horrifying. <laughs> One more PS2 game, and this is a uh, Lupin Sensei Columbus no Isan wa Akeni Somaru. I think I got that right. So, or better known as uh, Lupin the Third: The Legacy of Columbus's Inheritance. <laughs> this is a 2004 action adventure based on Lupin the Third, which is I did not know this a humongous media franchise in Japan uh, that started as a manga all the way back in 1967 and has had every type of media made about it from, you know, anime to movies and so on, and, and a lot of video games. This is just one of the video games. Um, but the story revolves around a, like a huge, very famous kleptomaniac and the adventures with his team of other kleptomaniacs, which is, which is pretty cool. So uh, this game, not a ton of recognition, or the series, I should say, not a ton of recognition here in the U.S., but some of the anime was dubbed like on Adult Swim early in the 2000s, and it had one game released in North America on PS2. Not this one, another Lupin PS2 game uh, that, that did come here, which is pretty interesting for a series that North America had probably never heard of, or rarely heard of at that time. So, it's funny, uh, prior to recording, I was having a conversation with Chris about the, the rise of anime here in North America, so he's going to see this and go, we just talked about that, we just talked about that, so. Cool, Lupin the Third. <laughs> Second to last system for the video is the PlayStation 1, so I'm not at all nostalgic for the PlayStation 1, but there are some very, very famous games that got their start on, on PlayStation 1 and, and around that time. So, got a handful of games here, we'll go through them, and uh, then there's one more game at the very end. So, first one is Kamrai, which is a 2000 RPG uh, where you play as both a human and a god in a world where they live together, which is actually pretty interesting. You do quests in uh, a protagonist that is a human, and a protagonist is a god, so you do quests separately in each other's shoes, and then you finally converge later in the game in like the sort of battle between human and god, which is a pretty good storyline. Uh, the battle system is mostly automatic, but you do have some control in your targets and small interferences, um, which is kind of interesting for a game that kind of closely resembles, resembles sam <laughs> Samurai, uh, that it's not like a hack and slash show. Uh, kind of interesting in that way, but Kamurai. Next up is a, a franchise that is very, very popular. So uh, Mega Man, let's talk about Mega Man for a second. The first Mega Man was released on NES and the Famicom in 1987. Very simple 2D platformers that made the series one of the most popular gaming franchises of all time, no doubt. Uh, even one of my professors in college said he was a huge fan of Mega Man 2. So there's a copy somewhere back there of Mega Man 2 just because he said he liked Mega Man 2. Then there's Mega Man X, which is a spin-off series uh, that began with the first Mega Man X on Super Famicom and Super Nintendo in 1993 as a more mature, more game-centric uh, Mega Man experience, a little bit more mature than regular Mega Man, uh, where you play as X, who kind of looks like Mega Man. You'll, you'll see on the cover of the game I'm about to show. Uh, but he was a sealed-away experiment that was eventually released, but he has the ability to think for himself, so there's a little bit of danger there. Uh, whereas Mega Man is considered, you know, perfectly good, uh, X is kind of considered uh, a little more up in the air as to whether or not he's, he's good at all times. That's at least what I read on Reddit uh, when, I, when I was researching for this game. So we got two of them. We got uh, Rockman X5 and X6. So I was just talking about Mega Man. Now I say Rockman. Rockman is just Japanese Mega Man, or you could say Mega Man is North American Rockman. So, Rockman 5 was released in uh, 2000 on PS1, and then Rockman X6 was released in 2001 on PS1. So, uh, that's about all I could say. I did most of the talking before I flashed the games on screen, but uh, Rockman. Mega Man. <laughs> Next up is another very popular franchise, uh, at least in Japan. Uh, this is Saga Frontier. 
So this game is a 1997 turn-based RPG that is on PS1. It is the seventh game total in the Saga series. Not seventh on PS1, seventh total in the Saga series, uh, but it's the first on PS1 and the first to use the Saga title in North America when it came over. Uh, prior to using the Saga title, it was better known as like Final Fantasy Legends. So a uh, different title just to try and catch American audiences, but finally they they uh, broke and started using Saga. So it's a somewhat free choice, open world type of game. Uh, you have your choice of one of seven characters to begin with, but each of them have your own storylines. You have this ability to travel to other regions and your goal is to complete all of the storylines, not just one and be done, to complete multiple storylines to unlock more stuff. So uh, not much I could say about it otherwise, but it was remastered uh, and brought to Switch and other systems in 2021. So there is a modern way of playing Saga Frontier. So I've seen Saga before. Um, I'm kind of picturing like romancing Saga, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, yeah, very popular series in Japan and one that you've probably, uh, maybe some of you have come across here in North America. So speaking of other very popular you know, RPGs, <laughs> this is a Star Ocean, the second story. This is a 1998 action RPG that is the second game in the Star Ocean series. Uh, and you play as a character who is uh, who goes to an undeveloped planet, gets transported to another planet that is inhabited, uh, but through a battle it ends up exploding, but you survive, and you have a cast of characters where your goal is to take down the ten wise men. That's a very complicated storyline, and I had a very hard time following it along when I was researching. Um, and not much I could say about that, but however, I remember in a Nintendo Direct not that long ago they brought some Star Ocean game, to switch or they announced that some star ocean game was coming and those games are pretty uh it's, it's got like the 2.5d graphics that are now kind of very popular especially on modern systems so not saying i will play star ocean but very pretty very popular series for sure so star ocean i think with the exception of uh the mega man the two mega man games i think every other game on ps1 that i got is a is an rpg uh pretty accurate PS1 is, is huge for RPGs. So the next one is Tales of Destiny, which is another action RPG, but it's the second game in the Tales series after Tales of Fantasia on the Super Famicom. And these two games, well, probably more so Fantasia, but it's spawned a huge media franchise. So like uh, Lupin started with a manga and became everything, including video games. Tales started with video games and expanded to everything else, which is pretty cool. In this game, you play as Stan, who discovers a mystical sword in a desperate moment of need and becomes famous for wielding the sword. Uh, you fight other swords people and your goal is to eventually acquire the Eye of Atamoni. How exciting is that? Is there an eye on here? I don't know. No idea. Uh, but com contrary to other uh, RPGs we've seen in this episode is that this one is not turn-based. So a lot of them are, are turn-based RPGs, whereas this one is a real-time combat system that that broke away from the popularity of uh turn-based rpgs which is pretty cool and also very popular for the time to to be a little different so tales of destiny uh yeah another tales game i think i have a few tales games i think a lot of them like i have on ps3 just winning lots like in my first summer of collecting japanese games but you know <laughs> these things happen next one is definitely a, a, another obscure one because there was very little info about it and even the info I did find about it, it was uh, very uh, filled with errors in the description. So we'll, we'll go with what we can get. Uh, this is Voice Paradise Excella, or a 1996 adventure question mark game where three alien girls come to Earth and they want to become heroines. So their way of becoming heroines is to fight humans, which seems a little backwards. Uh, but the player that you, you play as engages with them. And you engage with them in the way of quizzes. Just just question quizzes. I, I don't know how that works. Um, however, it is known for having very high quality anime cutscenes. And that is definitely true. When I watch gameplay of it, there there's it is very, very clean. So <laughs> that's that's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, voice Paradise Excella. And spelled different. Uh, paradise with a C. Unless unless Paradise is, is supposed to be a play on something else. But one more PS1 game, and we're, we're, we're getting there. Only two more games left in the episode, but this one is Wild Arms Second Ignition, Arms with capital A-R-M, 
and or just better known as Wild Arms 2 here in North America. But this one is a 1999 turn-based RPG, which is the second, uh, respectively, in its series about an anti-terrorist organization overcoming a terrorist organization, and each character has its own unique tools that help you traverse through the games. And I don't, I don't know if I could say much about it, but at least the the, the storyline of being an anti-terrorist organization taking on terrorist organizations kind of kind of screams like COD if it was an RPG. I don't know, that's probably way far-fetched, but that's at least what I gathered in the little bit of reading that I did. So, Wild Arms 2. And that leaves us with only one more game in the episode. Uh, not a Nintendo game, not a uh, Sony game, but instead a Sega Saturn game, which I don't think I've ever flashed before. I have some other Sega Saturn games that I may or may not need to make a video about at some point, but uh, this one came from Chris, so we're, we're, we're going to end with this one because it's actually got a pretty interesting story. So this is uh, D no Shokutaku, or just better known as D here in North America. So uh, it's a 1999, uh, sorry, 1995 interactive horror movie that was famously submitted in a cleaner state when it went to its rating. However, uh, upon manufacturer delivery, uh, it was switched with a more graphic version. Uh, obviously, the more graphic version wasn't going to be approved, so the developer... Uh, decided to switch the discs at the last moment and got that one <laughs> uh, published and made. So that's that's actually pretty interesting. That's a really great story. Uh, at least on the Wikipedia page, I didn't see anything of like huge backlash. But if anything, this game had incredibly good uh, critical reception at the time. So that's a pretty cool deal. Uh, the story follows a daughter needing to go to the hospital because her father, who works there, went on a killing spree. And she's going to check in and, and see what happened. Um, even when I was just reading the plot on, on Wikipedia, there are tons of twists that I didn't expect. I was just reading the thing, and um, for the sake of spoilers, I won't say anymore, but if you're into horror and you're into old interactive movies, uh, th this, this story is pretty good. I, I, I gotta admit, I, I'm, I'm a scaredy cat. I don't like anything horror. Not a lot of bloodshed in the movie, but it's still kind of scary. If this sounds like your kind of thing, definitely go check it out because I like the story and I don't like horror and I don't know if I could handle old old graphics like this. So uh, definitely go check out D and find out why it is called D <laughs> if that seems of any interest to you whatsoever. So with that said, that covers uh, 52 out of the 55 games that I got at Too Many Games. The other three... Not super family friendly. We'll we'll leave them on the side. Uh, but now that the two episode series is over, I just want to say thank you so much to Too Many Games for putting on an incredible convention. Uh, it was my first convention that I went to uh, in 2022, and it's one that I look forward to definitely the most every every June. Um, thank you to my friends Matt, Mike, and Charles for hanging out with me over the course of the entire weekend. Thank you again so much to Chris from Rewind Arcade. I'll put his uh, YouTube channel in the description. Please go check him out. Please go support him in any way you can. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, everybody involved for putting on an awesome weekend for Too Many Games. Uh, there's a reason why it's definitely one of the most famous uh, video game conventions, at least uh, in the Northeast, it seems. So uh, with that said, I hope you learned something about these games. I did very light research on these, so if I missed anything, uh, please tell me. I want to learn about them as much as I hopefully taught you something. And with that said, uh, bye!